if you haven't been with us, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke, and we're in chapter 11. We'll pick it up in verse 14 through down through 32. Uh, but I uh, just wanted to catch you up. Uh, the disciples had just saw and heard Jesus pray. And so they asked, can you show us how to do that? And so he does, and he gives them this, uh, this model or this pattern on how to pray. And he ended it with uh, kind of an interesting thing. We know the prayer, and then there's some verses after that about praying, but it gets the climax of it. It gets down to verse 13, and it says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And it was an interesting thing because what we had been talking about so far had been, well, we, need, we know to, to pray for the material things that we need for health and finances and those, but there's this other higher form of, of praying. It's kind of the, the graduate level of, of praying then. Let's not forget to pray about the Spirit of God because as we pray and ask for the blessings of the Spirit of God, what we find out, the result is, our Christian character and our Christian conduct becoming glorifying unto the Lord. Now, if you realize this or not, maybe you grew up on a farm or whatever, but did you know that if you have a milk cow, it isn't more considerate to milk her less. The only thing that happens, the less is demanded of her, the less milk that she produces or provides. The more milk you take, the more that is produced. And I think we need to remember that for our Christian lives also. When it comes to our Christian life, if we only turn to God when in need, like, okay, this is really bad, now I'm going to pray, right? If we only are at that level, we're going to miss out so much on the real joy that flows from a daily infilling of his spirit. So let's pray. Father, we pray for, well, spirit of the living God fall afresh on us. We sense that you did during our time of worship and song, but we pray simply for the same, that your spirit would fall upon us, helping us to understand, interpret your word, know what you were saying, especially in some of the hard sayings, God, that we would be able to get it and own it and embrace it into our lives. And so, God, we pray that your spirit would just continue to fall upon us, uh, that we would just be sensitive for all that you would like to, uh, to show us this morning. And so we invite you to be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. My first car I bought by myself, and that's the emphasis of my story here, that I bought by myself, was a 1971 Carmen Ghia convertible that I thought was over the top. It was red. It had this, uh, uh, this fleck paint in it that would kind of sparkle. It was a black new top. And that's really all I saw. The guy had it in this garage. You could barely kind of squeak around it. I was 16, so I didn't know what to ask or what to look for. All I know is like, okay, this looks pretty. And so I drove that baby home. And I get home, and my friend Steve, who lived next door, he walks up to the thing, doesn't say a word, and knocks on the fender. And he says, Bondo. Walks to the next fender, Bondo. And he goes around my car doing this, and on the front and on the back. And it's like, dude, what's Bondo? And he says, well, you know, and so when you get in a fender bender, right, they bend it back out as best they can. My mic keeps going in and out. Is it doing something weird there, Rob? Um, but, you know, and so he's, you know, you just, you put a really, you know, a small amount of Bondo on there just to smooth it up. But no, I think they were just crunched in. I just think they put like a pound of it on it all over the place. So I realized it was this Bondo beast. The second thing I found out just a couple of weeks later is I never looked underneath and underneath the whole thing was rotted out. So the whole floor pan was gone. Found out it was a car from Michigan where they put salt on the snow on the road and it just makes it eat away the any type of little bit of rust and it just eats all the way through that so needless to say I didn't have that one too long but I have a cousin named Jack and he was the mechanic of the family we would bring everybody in the in the family would bring their cars to uh, to Jack and and he knew how to assess cars I didn't at that time I did not know how to do that he did the story we're about to read, the, the people didn't have an accurate assessment of who Jesus is. They didn't know what they were talking about. And so they came up with an inaccurate assessment. And so over the last 2,000 years, people have been figuring out who is Jesus. I think he's Brad Pitt, if you see the middle to the right there. I, that might be, you know, a connection there. But they're trying to figure that out. Who is Jesus? And so that's what we're going to be looking at. And so we have five little sections as we walk through them. It'll move 
move pretty quickly, but ultimately that's what he's doing at this place in his ministry is explaining who he is. And so I'll put up behind me verses 14 through 20 and we'll read that first. And so Luke 11 verse 14. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute and when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, then a divided household falls. And if Satan who also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons, that would be the Jewish exorcists, how do they cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is the shortest miracle in all four gospels. It is one verse long. Verse 14 is the miracle. What we learn by this, because he's been talking a lot about it, but in it is, there is a demon, does it keep going out or is that just my head doing that? It's my, it's just my head? No, it's not my head. It probably is my head, but it's also the mic. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to do anything, Rob? Wait, let me shut it off real quick. We'll try that again. Sometimes it just is demon possessed because that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Get out. Okay. So it's the shortest account of a miracle. And so what we learn by this is the, the, the brevity of it is, is a clue. That it's not about the miracle itself. It's about the response to the miracle and their assessment, wrong assessment, of who Jesus is. And so that's where the discussion goes. The, the healing of a demon-possessed man, it, it, listens, it lit, elicits uh, mixed responses. And, it, and again, different assessments of Jesus. From open hos hostility, we thank your powers from the devil all the way to attempted neutrality, which we'll talk about in a couple of verses later. But basically two attacks on Jesus. Attack number one, you get your power from Satan. As if they're thinking about the Van Halen song, Running with the Devil, right? And so that's basically what they're saying. You're in collusion with the devil, that's how you're able to do this. The second one there, the second attack is, is just show us an, another sign. Show us another sign. So he's gonna deal with the first attack first, and then the second one he's gonna deal with at the, at, at the very end. But it's a false statement of the secret of his power. Now there's a character in the Old Testament, Belzebub, the Lord of the Flies, and in the New Testament, same one, Belzebul, the Lord of the House. And in a minute, he's gonna use specifically the, the word about talking about a demon possessing a person and talks about it possessing a house. It's where he lived, and so it's kind of a, a playoff of that, I believe. But basically, it's a, another name or another term for Satan. So it's this evil spirit, but it's connected uh, to Satan or the devil. And so Jesus shows how illogical it was for Satan to fight against himself. That, that, that makes no sense at all. So it's kind of like, let's step into the logic class 101, and this is a, a fallacy. A house divided is like cutting the branch that you're sitting on, or feeding the dog, feeding the dog, feeding the hand that feeds you, biting the hands that feeds you. There we go. Uh, or there's a number of them, and, but I'm not going to try anymore. But anyways, Satan does have a kingdom. So let's, let's, let's realize that. Satan does have a kingdom, and Jesus invaded it and, and conquered it. Matter of fact, his kingdom is really with every unbeliever. Not that he demon possesses every unbeliever. That's not what I'm saying, but basically they're his. Ephesians 2.2. 2. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And so that's how Paul explains the, the kingdom that he oversees is every believer excuse me, every unbeliever, uh, at the very end down in verse 20, we'll highlight that. But if it is the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so he dismantles their argument of thinking that this power comes from the devil, but he basically throws out to them at the end. And again, that's what he's doing. He's revealing who he is, or it could be the hand of, of God here. 
See, when in Matthew's account, he doesn't say the finger of God. He says the spirit of God. And so this, he uses this synonymous term then that Jesus says he's in league with the Holy Spirit of God. What are you going to do about that? So you're starting by saying I'm in league with the devil, but I'm not. But could it be that I am with God? That I am God? That's what he's laying out. Let's continue on because he kind of stays with the same theme. Jesus is the stronger one. Verse 21, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he divides his, excuse me, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. And then he wraps it up in 23, whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters we have to remember the greatest oppon opponent to God's people. Our greatest opponent is not another nation. It's not any other political party. It's not an ideology. It's Satan who was on his last hurrah before he's cast into the utter darkness forever. This is a strong versus stronger and I appreciate how he's representing Satan as being strong. And you and I should understand the power that is behind this fiend. And so with that, he's strong. But what happens when one stronger comes away? Again, he's still answering, really. They're, they're, they're saying, saying that, you know, and he already explained, it's not, he's not dividing his kingdom there. Did you just, just see what I did? Basically, I have power over him, complete power over him. He's showing complete mastery over Satan. Back in chapter 10, verse 18, and we went past it pretty quick, and he even said it pretty quick and moved on in his own speech. But Jesus has said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, this is before anybody walked on earth. This is way back in, in, in old times. And he's saying he saw it, which meant he had to be up in heaven with the Father, with the Holy Spirit. So that's where he had to bend. But he threw that out. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. See, the moral of the story is that Jesus is overthrowing Satan and making a people for himself. See, every time a believer gets saved, we sing, hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I didn't like it when we first sang it. I always have issues with, uh, with, with, with Romo's like, I don't like this line. And we, we, we debate it. And he tries to explain and, and usually wins the arguments. But, but with that, and, and so with that, when I first had it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's like thumbing your nose at the, at the devil, you know, kind of thing. And I just don't like doing that. I, I, I know and I appreciate the power that he has. And I just don't like talking about him. I don't like dealing with him. I don't like messing with him. I'd rather just run to Jesus and not be doing that. And so hell lost another one. It was just kind of seemed to be nan or nan nan or, you know, kind of thing at the devil, and I just uh, wasn't digging it. But understanding and seeing where we're at and what's happening here, Jesus is constantly pushing back the jurisdiction of Satan. And we see, we, we see clearly that the fight is fixed, better than those WWF fights, which are, for both of you that watch it, they're totally rigged, right? They're fixed, right? But, but this is a battle that has been fixed. Jesus has, in fact, won. Matter of fact, the battle is over. We're just watching it play out. The battle was over at the cross of Christ. He won. He got the victory. And we all go, no, Satan is still alive and well on planet Earth. And we sense him and we feel him and we see him at work and, and doing all of that. We're just simply watching it play out. This is a spiritual battle. But friends, we know the stronger one today. We know the stronger one. So Jesus' victory over Satan, it offers a life freed from the powerful grip of the evil one. But really more dangerous, listen, in verse 23, whoever is not with me is against me. What a phrase. More dangerous than open hostility is this attempted neutrality. You are in the family or you're not in the family. You're for him or you're against him. And a lot of times people are just like, no, 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 no. It's not this extreme or that. No, I haven't accepted Jesus yet. And I'm not a Satan worshiper. And, but as soon as I get married, as soon as I have kids, as soon as I get you know, farther down in, uh, in, in my business and in, in all of that, no, this is it right here. You can receive Christ or reject him, but you can't ignore him. You're in one of those two different categories. And it, I, I would even say it this way. I think God likes open hostility 
like a Saul of Tarsus who's running around killing Christians, that he would rather have you honest and transparent about who you are and where you're at and everything else because he just loves coming and rescuing people like that, like a Saul and turn him into a Paul and have him write the half of the New Testament and goes after guys like that. But to play this whole neutral game, he doesn't play. You can believe it in your mind that you're just kind of on the fence and I'm not sure yet. No, you've made up your mind. At least thus far, you're against him. You're not for him. And that's, that's, that's what he's saying there in that category because he loves the group that he's talking to. It's, a, it's an evil generation. He'll call them that in, in just a little bit. But he's trying to do whatever he can to light the fire underneath them to be able to see, do you see where you're going? You're slipping your way off to hell. And I want to step in and fill in the gap and, and show you the way. So let's talk about that. 24 through 26. Jesus is the gap filler. In 24, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, so we're still talking about demon possession, and it passes through waterless places or dry places or desert places, seeking rest and finding none. Interesting that even demons are trying to find peace and find rest and they'll never find it. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And so whoever he possessed before. But look what happens when he gets back. Verse 25. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. And then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Now, these aren't just scary ghost stories. This is talking about the seriousness of our our. our our number one enemy, the evil one, Satan himself, or Beelzebul, as we have here. If we set this in the positive, Jesus protects those he gathers from the demonic assault. That his whole goal is protection. That's part of the Holy Spirit and him sealing us. It's protection. Again, remember Jesus had just cast out a demon out of a man. And so part way is no way. See, in that day, they had these Jewish exorcists that would go around and perform exorcisms. It's talked about in the book of Acts. And so with that, they were able to do that. But here's the key. It must be replaced by a more powerful source of strength. Otherwise, what does it do? If you're a parent and you have a high schooler or maybe had just gone off to college and they get into something, and if your whole prayer is, oh Lord, don't let them do that, whether it's drinking or drugs or sex or whatever it is, free them from that, free them from that, and that becomes your thing. No, no, no. Send them to Jesus. That, that's what you want. Your prayer is they need Jesus at a deeper level. Maybe they don't know him. Whatever it is, they need Jesus because Jesus gets a hold of life. Then he cleans them up, right? It's like fishing, right? First you catch them, then you clean them. And for so long, the church would try to clean people up before they were even saved. And that's, that's, that's not the, the, the road that's here. And so with that, it isn't just about casting out the demon. Oh, great for that person, the demon's out of them for that time, but if it's not filled with something stronger, if it's not filled with something else, we have a problem. So some people, like this individual we have in the story, they'll try to live moral lives talking about sweeping and putting their house in order. They tidied up their life. They became good moralists, which a lot of times we think that's what Christianity is. No, I'll just be a good boy or a good girl. No, that's not what it's saying. And so that's, that's moralism. And that's not what Jesus came to bring. And so you try to just clean things up in your life. But it's not replaced with anything. If you've been on an underground subway, maybe over in Europe, you've seen the, the sign, Mind the Gap. And it's simply look down and notice that there's a little gap between the train and the platform. Don't step in it, right? It's the reminder to that. But kind of thinking of minding the gap, we shouldn't just mind the gap. We must fill the gap. And if you don't fill the God-shaped vacuum in our life, something else will. So it was Augustine way back in the fourth century and a brainiac for the church and he was the one who came up with that phrase that, that God built us this way, that we're missing something. 
And it's him. That was ultimately it. So he called it the God-shaped vacuum. And, but in that, we all felt it. We all sensed it before we got saved. And so we'd shove drugs in that hole thinking that would do it. That would bring us the peace that we were looking for uh, or the, the satisfaction or whatever else and, or sex or whatever it was. But we, we all tried different things to, to plug into that hole, but it's only, it's only God that can fill that. And so it's not just about being healed from demons, but being sealed. Not just about being healed from demons, but being sealed from them by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need a new tenant. So it's not about reformation. It's about regeneration, right? He's not looking for you just to, come on, be good, reform your life. No, it's a miraculous work by God to regenerate us, to take something that is dead and make it alive. That's what regeneration is and that's what God can do. And so he says, you need a new nature. And so we're born with a corrupt nature. It's corrupt in, a, in our thoughts, in our affections, and in our will, as Jonathan Edwards said. But when, when we're reborn, we receive a new nature, a new mind. Let this mind be you and you. The same mind that was in Christ, it says. And so it's a, a, a new intellectual nature that is no longer blind to the truths of God. The Holy Spirit opens your eyes, your spiritual eyes, to be able to read and understand what he's saying. And so he gives us, when we're born again, he gives us these new, uh, new, new tastes and new loves. No longer loving those things that displease God, but in fact loving the things that please him. And get this, God gave us his own nature. That's what, it's really trippy. If you're reading through the first John and you get to chapter three and I think it's verse seven, eight, nine, right in that area there. And it says, those who are born again, do not sin. And you're reading it and that's where you go, wait a minute, I I think I've sinned since I got saved in these last 42 years. Uh, Yeah, wait a minute. What's it saying here? But what it's saying is, you have your old nature. Unfortunately, it doesn't go away. You have your old nature. God gives you his own nature and places inside of you. His own nature never sins. When you lean towards the spirit and, and, and do what the spirit is calling you to do and you're doing the right thing, you're not gonna sin. The only time we sin is when we lean the other way and go towards the flesh. And that's the war that continues to take place inside of us. God gave us his own nature. That's what lives inside of us. That's why we have hope. So please know, an empty life is an opportunity for Satan to move in and take over. And so if you just say, okay, I'll just get rid of the drinking, just get rid of the drugs, getting drunk, doing whatever, and and then I'll, what? You need Jesus. Here's a short one. Jesus is a spiritual family blesser. Verse 27 and 28. As he said these things, so he's still, he's right in the middle of his preaching. A woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is fun. It just would have been awesome to watch Jesus preach. And just as a, a, as a great communicator, Obviously, more than that, he's God. But, but with that, it's like a good comedian on the stage and, uh, you know, a heckler from the audience and they just play off of it immediately in that way. And so he, he takes and, and takes what this gal says and recalibrates her, her zeal. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, see, isn't passed down biologically. Your parents can't get saved and make you saved, right? In, instead, it's by tr- uh, spiritual transformation. That, that's the way we get saved. And so she's yelling out, oh, how happy is your mom? And he's basically responding, yes, she is. Yeah, out of all of the women on the planet, she was chosen to deliver the Messiah. Every woman before, every woman after her, absolutely blessed. It even says that earlier on in Luke, absolutely. But oh, how happy is anyone, but more than that, Oh, how happy is anyone who hears my words and puts them into practice. Now, notice what Jesus did. He didn't put mom down. He loves his mother. He didn't put Mother Mary down. Mother Mary. He didn't put Mary down, but simply raises all believers up. That's that's what he's doing here. And it's, it's, it's pretty great how he handled this whole thing. See, Mary's best relationship. Here's, here's kind of what I'm thinking he's, he's thinking. Mary's best relationship isn't mother-son relationship. Mary's best relationship is sinner-savior. One is temporal, one is eternal. 
That's where he's going with this. Wait a minute, Brian. Did you say Mary was a sinner? No, I didn't say it. Mary did because in Luke chapter 1, verse 47 is where she gives her magnificent. That means from the word, that's a Latin word for, for magnificent, right? And she's saying how awesome God is. And so she busts forth in Luke chapter 1, verse 47 and says, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Emphasis on the word, underline the word, my Savior. Why would she call him a savior? God, my savior. Did she need to be saved? Yes. See, if you are an unfallen angel, you're a perfect angel, you've never sinned before, they do not need a savior. They are perfect beings who have never sinned. And so with that, they don't even comprehend what you and I comprehend about needing a savior. And that's why it says in 1 Peter 1, 21, 22, somewhere in that area, uh, where it specifically says that the angels look in, want to look into, they're going to be asking us questions about. They've never experienced grace, mercy, being saved, those kind of things. And it'll be fun conversations because we'll get to say, well, how do you actually fly with those wings? You know, whatever. And we'll get into good conversations with them. But in that, all that to say, Mary knew she needed a savior. And why that's the more important relationship and why he's saying he's not trying to put down mom. What he's trying to say is what I'm, we're talking spiritual things here. And yes, yeah, a great family relationship. Love my mom. But what about eternity? And what about a relationship that we must have between sinner and savior We must have that's going to go for all eternity? Here's our last one and then we're blessed to have uh, communion together this morning. Verse 29 excuse me, to 32. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. <laughs> now, you imagine starting off this way. I thought he didn't read the book on winning friends and, you know, influencing others. But anyway, this generation is an evil generation. Then he says, why? It seeks for a sign. So we just went back to that group of people in the very beginning when he cast out the demon, right? That we talked about, he's going to answer that. It seeks for a sign. That's why he's saying it's evil. Why is it evil? But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Now we know from Matthew's account of a little bit more detail of what, what about Jonah's life. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And so he's talking about his death and resurrection that obviously has not happened yet. But that's the only sign. You don't get any other sign. That's going to be... The most incredible sign. Verse 31. The queen of the south, you and I know her in the Old Testament, is the queen of Sheba, which is actually in the area of, actually Sheba, which is actually in Yemen today, okay? And so it says the, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. I love this whole section here of, of what's happening. It's just fascinating. The word greater is in the neuter. And what that means in the, in the Greek, uh, that it, it's, in the, it's, it's not a comparison or a contrast with Jonah and Jesus, but in fact, in, their, uh, in the ministry of Jonah. There's a difference, there's a contrast in the ministry that Jonah had and the ministry that Jesus had. And so it's his ministry of, of prophecy. And notice it's not someone greater is here, which he was, but it's something greater, and that is this, this ministry, and that's what he draws the distinction in. How did Jesus have the greater ministry of prophecy? Well, Jonah preached the word to Nineveh. He did. Jesus is the word to all generations. He's greater. Jonah reluctantly preached salvation to Nineveh. He hated the people of Nineveh. He did it all reluctantly, if you remember his story. But Jesus is salvation to all who believes. Jonah hated Nineveh because of how wicked they were. But Jesus loves us even though he knows everything about us. Everything about us. Jesus is the greater prophet. Side note. Nineveh getting saved. You know what they were presented? They weren't presented the good news. They weren't presented the gospel. Whatever the opposite of gospel is, that's what they got. They got the bad news. 
Matter of fact, here's how he went to preach. He hated him so much. When he finally gets there, reluctantly, you remember what, getting spit up on shore by the fish and everything else. He finally goes, and here's his words. Yet 40 days in Nineveh, yet, in for, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's basically, picture him with a bullhorn coming up and saying, you're all going to hell in 40 days. See ya. That was his message. And the whole place gets saved from the king all the way down to the donkey. It even mentions the animals. I mean, this whole, there's never been a revival like it ever before. That's, that's his point. That's what he's saying here is they get the bad news of the gospel and they still all get saved. And you guys not only have heard the gospel, but have seen the gospel and you're rejecting it completely. And so these Gentiles, the, the Queen of Sheba, she comes all of that distance to hear about Solomon and Solomon's God. And, uh, and all the men of Nineveh, well, the issue is Gentiles. A Gentile woman, this all Gentile men from, from Nineveh, Ari and all of that, they're gonna stand before you on judgment day because look what little that they had and yet the seed was birthed in their heart and they had this relationship with God. But look, you got God himself standing in front of you and trying to teach you and talking about higher spiritual matters and you just keep dismissing it. Because our good news this morning is this. You can know Jesus, the greater prophet, if you're willing to repent and believe in the final sign, the final sign here, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his resurrection. Lastly, the greater king, Again, the comparison and contrast of his office of kingship, Solomon and Jesus here. How is he the greater king? Well, he's the wealthier king. And uh, Psalm 50, verse 10 through 12, for all of the animals of the forest are mine, God says, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains and all the animals of the field are mine. And if I were hungry, I would not tell you for all the world is mine and everything in it. And then John 1, 3, so that's talking about God, owning all of this stuff. In John 3, it says, God created everything through him, through Jesus, and nothing was created except through him. And so we see Jesus is, is uh, 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 spoken of as being our, the creator, and all of these things are him. And so he is the wealthier king, and lastly, he is the wiser king. He's not just full of wisdom like Solomon was, but he is the wisdom of God, and he's the sovereign king where his revelation starts to wrap up in chapter 19 on his robe and on his thigh it was a name written king of kings lord of lords there it is king of kings king over any king that ever existed here is our jesus king of kings and lord of lords good news this morning is you can be a citizen of the kingdom of the greater king so this morning what's your assessment of who jesus is is he despised in your heart Maybe somebody drug you here this morning and really don't want to be here. Maybe something happened with you in your past. Maybe something some Christian did to you, ripped you off, whatever else. Is, is he someone who needs to constantly prove himself to you? I used to make God do that all the time. i make him. And the funniest thing is he would actually do it. It was, in the, it was in the dumbest things, but I was a brand new believer and I was you know, in college, a parking spot. Lord, if you give me a parking spot, I know you, then I for sure will know and one would open up each and every time. It'd be surfing, it'd be sitting out there, no waves are coming and I'd start singing this one song, this one worship song that I had just learned, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. That was like brand new back in the early 80s and uh, he'd bring a wave. It would just, it would, I would make himself prove me and then all of a sudden I realized what I was doing. And I felt so bad. I felt so stupid. I felt so bad. And I apologized to him. And I said, oh my gosh, every time I'm asking you to prove yourself is saying that I don't believe in you. But I do believe in you. I am one of your kids. What am I thinking? I'll never ask you to do that again. When he went like this on the cross, right? He showed us how much he loved us, right? I don't ever have to see that. I, I, I never need to ask that of you again. That A, you're real, what you've done, all of those different things, and I stopped it on the spot. But maybe you're at the place of constantly just asking God to prove himself to you. Do you need that? Is he your Lord? Have you chosen a side or are you playing that neutrality game? Let's remember the milk cow in the beginning. Milk away. The Holy Spirit loves providing all you need for life and godliness. That's what Peter says. All you need for life and godliness. Holy Spirit will do that for you. 
Let's be careful because he's uh, intensely sensitive against sin. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. And no, every time we read our Bible, it's possible to have the divine person himself, the author of this book, to interpret it for us, to teach, it, teach us its, its real and innermost meaning every time we come to his book. Let's pray as our uh, worship team comes back out and we get ready for communion. Father, thank you for uh, your spirit. Thank you come, for coming and living and indwelling in us. Thank you as we understand and reminded of that you are the, uh, there's a strong one out there, but you're the stronger one. You're the strongest. We recognize, God, we need you not just to get saved. We need you today. We need you in our lives. We need your help. We need your goodness, and we see it everywhere. We thank you for that. God, we pray that you would just uh, invade this room, our hearts, during our communion time, as we've gotten to worship you in song, we've gotten to worship you in your word, and now we get to worship you at your communion table. And so thank you for the beautiful invitation to come. In Jesus' name. Please hear this morning that invitation to come to his table. You might think that I, I'm not good enough to come to his communion table or you don't know where my thoughts were just earlier today or what I did this last week or whatever else. Uh, yeah, that goes for all of us. But the invitation is to come, not stay as far away from me as you can because the whole aspect of communion, the bread represents repentance and forgiveness and the cup represents thanksgiving and so that's what it's about. There is a... There's a chair at the table, so to speak, for each and every one of us. And he's waiting for you and says, come, come partake. Let's, let's break bread together. And we get to do it as a family also. Uh, so during this next song, your invitation is to come up and get communion. It's at the front, it's in the middles, and it's in the back. In the middles. It's in the middle and in the back. And uh, take it to double cup. Bring that back to your seat. Hold on to it and we'll partake together. Uh, But let's go ahead and do that uh, at this time as we worship him, as we confess our sins before him. Let's do that now.
let's take the bread in our hands. Father, we, uh, we know as before we take this bread, what you call us to is to repent of our sins. And Lord, we realize that we have committed sins against you and we have um, physically, we have in our minds. But I also think back also, Lord, of uh, just what we talked about this morning. There's so many different ways we have misunderstood you. We've wrongly assessed who you are or how you would feel or act in a certain situation. And so, God, we ask forgiveness for that. Lord, in the times that we've blamed you for something that happened in our life, and it wasn't you at all, thought you meant us harm, maybe, in a situation, Lord, forgive us. When we thought we understood a pretty situation well, and we were so upset at you, and then further information came in, we realized we didn't have the full story, like most of the time. God, forgive us for judging you. Forgive us for our sins directly against who you are, your very nature. Lord, forgive us. We also say, God, before we take this bread, thank you for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Thank you for your son Jesus and his death on the cross for us. Thank you for the guarantee of your Holy Spirit living inside of us until we get home with you. Let's partake of the bread together. Lord, we pick up this uh, cup of thanksgiving and we give you thanks. We look back over our lives and realize when we were hungry, you fed us. And when we were thirsty, you gave us drink. And when we were spiritually naked, you clothed us in your righteousness. And when we were, when we needed a home, you welcomed us in. And when we were in prison, you freed us. When we were sick, you healed us. And when we had no right to come to your communion table, all the more you invited us. Thank you. Because you know us so well. You know us so perfectly. There's nothing we can hide from you. And you still have a big smile upon your face and seeing us as your sons and daughters and always saying, you're welcome. You're welcome to my table. You're welcome to my family. You're always welcome. We say thank you for that. Let's partake in the cup together. Amen. It's good worshiping with you, studying with you, and having communion with you. Let's all stand for our last song.